Would you turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7? Now, there's not a lot of teaching in the Gospel of Mark. Not like Matthew, or even Luke, or John, with his really, really deep teachings. But there is teaching. And we come to the very center of the Gospel of Mark, and to a very central teaching that Jesus brought. And I'd like to take a look at this here. And we can always, all of, the, all of these Gospels are so familiar to most of us. We've been reading them for years. But you can always get something more out of them. The Holy Spirit can extract so much out of every single page of Scripture. Because it's not written by man. It's written by God. And therefore God never, ever, ever runs out of content. Now I want you to go to Gospel Mark chapter 7. And I'm going to read this. There's three things I want to look at in this chapter. And they all flow into each other. Number one is that um, there came together unto him, verse 1, the Pharisees and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, eat not holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be which they have received to hold, as the washing of cups and pots and brass vessels and of tables. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? And he answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah the prophesied of you, hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men, for laying aside the commandment of God. You hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups, and many other such things you do. Now, always remember there's a continuity. There's a flow in the Bible. And the last thing that happened in Mark chapter 6, a couple of things, is Jesus and his disciples fed the 5,000 men and their children and their families and everything like that. Very important. Now, how do you think they distributed that bread? With their hands. The Bible says Jesus picked up the bread and broke it and blessed it and then gave it to them. And they went out there and distributed it. And then they gathered up the leftovers, right? So the disciples and Jesus handled this bread with their hands. And a great miracle was performed. A fantastic miracle. Also a sign. Because the sign is that Jesus is the new Moses. Like Moses in the wilderness who gave bread out in the middle of nowhere. The new Moses. Moses said a prophet would come just like me. And that's the new Moses. And so Jesus walked on the water and Jesus gave food in the wilderness. And he did it with his hands. And then the last part of uh, Mark 6 says that people started just swarming Jesus. And they were sick. Um, all kinds of sickness. That would include leprosy and bleeding issues. And, and Jesus allowed them to touch him. They'd grab his garment or they'd grab him. And as many as touched him were made whole. Okay. You got to keep that in mind to understand the nature of this Mark 7, 1 through 7. Because it's a direct attack. Remember, the Pharisees are trying to make the point that Jesus is the agent of Satan. If Jesus is unclean, and giving out bread, then that means everyone he gave the bread to is unclean. If Jesus is unclean, that means everyone who touched him is unclean. So what's the attack? The Pharisees came and said, why don't your disciples, why don't you allow your disciples to eat with defiled, that is to say with unwashed hands? Now look, this, this first of all, even in their mind, this has nothing to do with hygiene. This is about ritual uncleanness. Okay, here's the thing. The law, the law of God set Israel apart because there's a lot of cleansings in the law of God. 
There's a lot of instruction what to do if someone dies or if you've got leprosy in the family. There's, there's mikvah bats. I mean, the Jews were very clean already in the first place. But the Pharisees had, uh, were subscribers, and so were most of the so-called remnant of the day, to two laws. The law of God and what's called the oral law or the tradition of the elders. Now, those two laws, okay, the law of God and the tra tradition of the elders. It's like the Catholic Church. The, uh, they have an uh, accumulation of all the teachings down through the ages. So you got the Bible, and that's, that's not really, the Bible's not really that big of a book. But if you get all the, all the accumulation of the elders and all the accumulation of the saints down through the ages, I mean, you have like a massive library, okay? In my view, that's Satan's way of just obliterating the Bible. Give you so much that you can't, you, you, the Bible gets lost in it, all right? That's what was already happening back then. The, the, the Pharisees uh, were the back to the Bible movement of the day. So they began all right, okay? But they go from, well, let's get back to the Bible. That's why we're so cursed and judged because we're so far from God from the Bible. They get back, okay? But then by the time of Jesus, which is 200 years after the Phariseeism started, it's like, in order not to break the law, we're going to put a fence around the law. Okay, what's that, what's that mean? Like, we're going to tell you that the, the law says um, you should not work. Okay, six days should you labor, on the seventh you should rest. Well, then we're going to make a law about what rest means. And we're going to make a law about what work means. And then that one sage gives this law, and then another comes along and says, we're going to make a law about the law about what work means. What is work? I mean, if you pick up a suitcase, is it work? If you pick up a wash basket, is it work? If you light a candle, is it work? To this day in Israel, the Orthodox Jews will not just hit light switches on Sabbath because that's work. If you kindle a fire, is it work? Okay, now look, God gave a law about the Sabbath day, and that law was designed to give man rest. By the time the Pharisees are through, a couple hundred years of the oral law and all these traditions and sages and opinions, they had 1,500 sub-laws covering the Sabbath. You were so glad when Sabbath was over so you could just get back to work. What was intended as rest for man became bondage. And the other thing about it is, is, is that you can't really have two laws. Sooner or later, you will gravitate to one law. You can't have two laws. That's what it means when it says, no man can serve two masters. He will either love the one and hate the other, or he'll despise the one and uh, cling to the other. Okay. Sooner or later, the one law has to be supreme. Now, this, is, this has got application for everybody. What are you going to go by? What's your authority going to be? Is it going to be the word of God or a bunch of people's opinions? or a bunch of commentaries, or a bunch of experts. See, the Pharisees made a delegation to Jesus and the scribes. They came all the way from Jerusalem. You know how far they had to come to get to Jesus? 78 miles, because he's in Capernaum, up in Galilee. They, they traveled 78 miles. Why? They heard about the miracle of the loaves and the fishes. So what's the first thing they get out of it? Do they say, wow, this must be the new Moses. He's got bread in the wilderness. It's a miracle. You fed 5,000 people with five loaves of two fishes. Nope. They accuse him of being defiled and his disciples of being defiled. Why do you eat with common hands? What it literally says. Why do you eat with unholy hands? Because they had rituals. Okay, the law of Leviticus says priests, when they offer sacrifices on the altar must wash their hands. That's why in the temple they had a, a laver, a huge basin of water on the backs of 12 bulls. And the priests would constantly wash before they offered sacrifice. You don't want to offer a sacrifice with unclean hands. Okay, but that's priests. What the Pharisees were doing, to the extent that they did go by the word, is they're going to say, you know what? If it's good enough for priests, it's good enough for us. It's good enough for everybody. In fact, not only is it good enough for everyone. See, this is how this starts. By the time of Jesus, it's binding on everybody. In other words, if you don't do it, that's a sin. Jesus, you're a sinner. 
Your disciples are sinners. Your miracles are sins. They're still trying to forward the lie that Jesus is an agent of Satan. You eat, you eat bread with unwashed hands. Now look, this is the essence of Phariseeism. And Phariseeism is common. It's a lot more common than people think. The essence of Phariseeism is you, you bind people's conscience where God hasn't. I mean, the first time I ever ran into this, and I didn't even know that much about it at all, but I got saved in an Assembly of God church, and after a few weeks they said, you want to be a, a member of the church? I said, uh, nothing I'd love more. I'm totally zealous and into the Lord and everything. And they said, well, take a look at this thing here, and if you can sign this, then we'll accept you into membership. And the list of things you couldn't do, like you can't go to movies and you can't do this and you can't do that. And it's like, even if I never wanted to go to another movie for the rest of my life, I'm not going to sign something like that. Why? Because it violates something. It violates the conscience. Now, here's one of the great points of this chapter of the Bible that Jesus teaches. It goes into great teaching. There's not much teaching on Mark, but this is the central teaching, is that you're to be inwardly guided. We're not to be put into bondage, and we're not to put other people in bondage where God hasn't put them in bondage. There are many things that God does bind our conscience. Like, you shouldn't kill someone. You shouldn't live a lustful life. You shouldn't be adulterous. I mean, don't, that's enough for me. I mean, there's already things that you should have a conscience about. But when people, and this is a natural thing. It happens all the time. Look, it, it even happens in civic life here in America. Look at, look at all the laws and laws upon laws upon laws upon laws that are passed. Every time one of those laws is passed, some element of freedom is gone to people. Okay, uh, what, 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 law, this ought to be obvious, right? Law can't save. Law certainly won't make you holy. You gotta be inwardly guided. But Phariseeism was about uh, salvation by separation. We are not gonna be defiled. So if you go to a Gentile's home, now even the disciples, even the apostles, Believe that teaching long after Jesus rose from the dead. The holy God had to give Peter a vision and say, now look, I want you to go to a Gentile's house. And I want you to, you know, he's been waiting to hear from you. And Peter's like, I, why would I go to somewhere unclean? He, even he bought into that until God set him free from it. And when he got to the house, there was a house full of Gentiles waiting to hear the gospel. Peter, the first thing he says, is, I don't know what I'm doing there. It's not lawful for me to go into a Gentile's house, but God has shown me. Now here's another point. Peter didn't get those convictions from someone teaching him the Bible. There is nowhere in the Old Testament where it told a Jew not to visit with a Gentile. There is nowhere on earth where it told Jews, that if you touch a Gentile, if you do business with a Gentile, if you buy a chicken in the market from a Gentile, you're unclean. Nowhere at all. But Phariseeism, like it says right here in this passage, for they have their rules. If you go to the market, you know what? If you went to the market, you had to come home and take a bath because Gentiles are there. Okay. Now what this does is it creates schism upon schism upon schism because First of all, it's the Gentiles, and then what about the Jews that don't keep the Pharisaic laws? Well, you've got to get away from them. Well, what about the Jews that don't keep the same Pharisaic laws to the level we do? Well, you've got to get away from them. You see what I'm saying? It just totally divides people, and it puts people in bondage in their conscience. Now, believe it or not, I see this with the mass thing. One of the big conf conflicts I have with the mass they want to make your conscience bad. To me, that's the mark of Satan. They want you to feel guilty for not doing what they want you to do. And the only question I ask and the only question you should ask is, God, what do you want me to do? The only one that has a power over my conscience is God. I'm, I'm not going to let someone. Now, now look, I see in this story, Jesus was not going to let that happen. Okay. And that's where he takes this occasion to give the most intense teaching in, in all of Mark, okay? 
uh, Mark's explaining to us, verse 3, the Pharisees and all the Jews, unless they wash their hands often, they don't eat, holding the tradition of the elders. I can show you debates in Mishnah that go for page after page after page after page. Should you wash your hands between each course of the meal? Should you wash your hands before and after the meal? Should you wash your hands before you say the grace? Hours of that stuff, okay? These are the opinions of the sages. Now look, I told you at the beginning, Jews had two laws. Here's their problem. They were deceived because they felt like they were devoted to God and his law. But the truth is, in practice and even in their own sayings, the oral law, the tradition of the elders, superseded God's law. See, nobody can live by two laws. Nobody. One law has to be supreme. No one can serve two masters. So the, the other stuff crowded out the word of God. And Jesus is going to go on and explain that, see. The word of God doesn't tell you to do all that. They spent hours. They eventually wrote down the oral law. It's called the Mishnah. And I mean that's thousands of pages of arguments about everything, every single little aspect, detail of life. And then they miss the big thing, the coming of the Messiah by their religion. And guess what? They're so fooled, they think that they're devoted to God doing this. It says, uh, when the, oh, so that when they come from the market for Lest they wash, they eat not. Oh, you've been to the market? Gentiles are there. Go take a bath. They had mikvahs, baths. They took a lot of baths. Remember in the, in the um, Gospel of John at the wedding of Cana? It says they had uh, great big jars at the house full of water. What were they for? For cleansing. If you really wanted to keep this, you were constantly cleansing. Now, what does a person do in our society when they go crazy? They start washing their hands over and over and over again, right? They get paranoid. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, why won't your disciples walk according to the traditions of the elders? It gets to a point in the Mishnah where they say, you know, the tradition of the elders is more significant than the prophets and the law. It's more, much higher. And one of them said, I would take one sage which means one of these elders, over a thousand prophets. Okay, so they, basically it becomes idolatry, all right? And they have all kinds of idolatrous notions. Remember that Jesus came 40 years before Israel was so utterly destroyed, they had never experienced destruction like that. They have never gotten over it to this day. They were apostate. And yet, it's the worst kind of apostasy. The worst kind of apostasy is when you're so far from God, but you don't think so. When you think you're a zealot, you're sold out. Now look what Jesus preaches to him. And if they would have listened to him, it could have been different. He quotes Isaiah. He answered and said, well, hath Isaiah the prophet prophesied of you hypocrites. What is a hypocrite? Now, let me just repeat this. This is a play actor. Hypocrite is literally the word for an actor. A play actor. You know those faces you see as decorations in theater, a big smile and big frown? That was literally Greek theater. And that's, those were called hypocrites. Okay. What is a play actor? Well, what are they playing at? They're playing at devotion to God. They're pretending to be absolutely, utterly sold out to God. How sold out to God? More sold out to God than anybody. More sold out to God than other Jews even. More sold out to God than previous generations. If priests had to wash their hands, and by the way, that was up to the elbow, okay? Like a surgeon, before they offer a sacrifice, then we're going to do that before we have a meal. In fact, this is another part of their idolatry. See, idolatry is very subtle and very dangerous. Part of their idolatry, anything you put above God is idolatry. These people are going to be holier than each other, holier than anyone that ever came before. Here's where it gets really bad. Holier than the law itself. Because the law says just rest on Sabbath day, they take it into another level. 
holier than God. Some of these sages from the time of Jesus, first century, very revered people to this day by the Jews. They had these crazy stories about him. For example, one, it said he was so pious and holy that when God himself had a question about scripture, he would consult rabbi so-and-so. That's blasphemy. That, that's just, what? how do you get that way? Look, it's never far away. Why isn't it ever far away? Well, let me quote someone that I don't really agree with most, for the most part, but he did have a good line. That's John Calvin said, the heart is an idle factory. Idolatry is the default mode. If you're not careful, we can put anything and everything above God. And they had the most scrupulous people on earth, probably. But they end up as idolaters. And Jesus gives them this prophecy from Isaiah, which they, they would have known. Well, hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Notice two, two parts of the person, the lips, which are external, but the heart, which is the core of your being. And they were really good at praising God and blessing God. They actually had a blessing for everything. And they were constantly praising God and blessing God and doing this for God and doing that for God. And they were getting, even the sages would even give them new blessings for God. Oh man, did their lips ever praise God. But they had no idea that their heart was so far from God. Now how, how do we know their hearts were far from God? When God came to them in the flesh, they killed him because that's how far a person's heart can be and deicide that's a human default too when God came to him and them in the flesh now God was dealing with them see when you read Mark chapter 7 it's no longer like a rabbi Jesus of Nazareth fighting with the sages no this is God himself dealing with a wayward nation and he's saying look I'm warning you now the prophecy from Isaiah and I won't take you back there, but we did do Isaiah. It was from Isaiah 29, which is a whole chapter against Ariel, which is the pet name for Jerusalem and is a prophecy of warning of utter destruction and judgment coming. And then this is part of the reason why, because you're, you, you praise God with your lips, but your heart is far from me. How do we know that? Well, in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Now, this is very familiar, but I don't want, I would still like to be didactic and take, take you through this, okay? What is the essence of their sin? Well, God gave us a word. If you really love God, you will love that word. You will not want to distort that word. You will not want to be frivolous with that word. You will not want to twist that word. God gave us a word, a rule of life, a revelation of him from heaven is the greatest gift other than the son himself that God could give us. He gave us a word, but they had two words. They developed two words. Why isn't God's good word good enough? Wouldn't, take, take, wouldn't it be taking that second word and exalting it above God? Wouldn't that be your idolatry? We have these men that are so holy among us. Wow. How holy. Holier than God. They'd never say that. Not in a million years, but that's what they're saying. That's what Jesus said. You want to know how your heart's far from me? Well, you take the commandments of men. It's just, it, you know, it's just in the smallest thing like that Assembly of God church. I mean, I love that church. It's taught me so much. It taught me how to worship. And I was, a, I was a member anyway. That's another thing. If you're born again, you are a member of the church. What are you talking about? But that, it's that human thing. It's that human thing. And to make sure that our members are holy and righteous... Just sign right here that you won't go to a movie. <laughs> Even if I never intended to go to another movie for my whole life, 
something told me this is a violation of my conscience because I do know that we are to be inwardly guided, right? We are to follow God with a good conscience. That's a good subject for another time, the conscience. You gotta make sure it's clear and healthy because it's such an important instrument, but it can be misguided, right? And one of the ways that consciences get injured is when religious people bind people, bind their conscience, put a, a load on them that not even God's putting on them. He says, uh, in vain they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men. Uh, as uh, the washing of pots and cups and many other such things you do. Now they would agree with the second part of that. They had no idea they were doing the first part. We do have these amazing laws of holiness that, about cups, washings, uh, mikvahs, mitzvahs, all kinds of really awesome, beautiful things to help us in our holiness. That they would admit to. But Jesus said, yeah, but you don't realize you are laying aside the word of God in order to do that. Now why? Because you can only have one law. You can't have two. The law of the assemblies of God, the law of believers in grace. If you have two laws, then sooner or later you're gonna hate the one law and love the other. Now, let me go on. Verse nine. He said to them, what, now what a rebuke. Full well, you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. See, this is about several things. This is about laws. This is about authority. Which authority? You can't have two authorities. What is the real authority? Is it the sages? Is it the general council of the assemblies of God? <laughs> what are you going to live by? can't be some pastor, it can't be some leader, it can't even be someone you admire and like. There's only one authority. See, and th this is the beautiful thing. I mean, like Jesus is speaking as God to the nation of Israel. He's also speaking as a devout, sold out believer. He's a man too, God, the God man. He's not going to let them bind his conscience. He's not. Just like the Apostle Paul, he followed Jesus the same way. That they were saying, Paul, you're bringing uncircumcised people into the church. That's wrong. And they were spying him out. He told about it. They spied out to see if Titus was circumcised and it was scandalous that he wasn't. And I mean, they were trying to bind him. As if if you don't go by their laws, then you're less than in the will of God. And that's what uh, defective and backslidden religion always does it just it, it 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 isolates and destroys people who don't go along with the man-made program now look if someone can make an argument that it's of god then uh, of course we're all bound by god i mean god has given his word i mean homosexuality is wrong right it's just wrong it doesn't not pastor bill it doesn't say that it's god that says that okay just frivolous divorce is wrong fornication is just wrong i'm not a pharisee for standing by that all right but then it's the thousands of other laws that people come up with that put bondage on people and destroy their faith ultimately and it can become an idol now he's going to give a great example, but a terrible example. This example is terrible, what they did, but it's just one example of what they were doing along this principle. It's about the well-known commandment, honor thy father and thy mother, right? Now that is as simple as you can get, right? You have a father and mother. God gave you that father and mother. He put you in that family. And he doesn't even say you got to like them, okay? But you must honor them. You must. And you must take care of them as they took care of you. Well, Jesus brings this up. Verse uh, 9. He said to them, Full well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever curses his father or mother 
Let him die the death. Okay, he does two things in his use of scripture here. Jesus quotes the Ten Commandments, the, one of the Ten Commandments, but he doesn't say that it may be well with you. And then the second thing he does is he quotes from Exodus 21 that says, whoever curses his father and mother should be put to death. Now, why is he doing this? He's talking to people that know scripture. Why is he doing this? Because he's warning them that this sin that they're engaged in, this destruction of the word of God, this exaltation of man's traditions is going to bring the death penalty on the nation. Whoever curses his father or mother will be put to death. Honor your father and mother. But he doesn't go on and say that it may, may, may be well with you, like it says in Deuteronomy. Okay, he says, but you say. Remember, two laws. You know what Jesus is saying? Get rid of all that junk. Throw it out. Your life depends on it as a nation. It's going to bring judgment on you. It's terrible. What are you saying? Moses said, <laughs> Moses is a good authority. Moses is a man of God. He spoke to God face to face, and God gave the law through Moses, right? But you say, okay, now Jesus could do this. He did this in the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard that it had been said by them of old time, but I say. But he's not doing the same thing they're doing. What's he doing in the Sermon on the Mount? He's giving the true interpretation of Moses. These people aren't going to try and interpret Moses here. You know what they're going to do? They're going to look for a loophole to get around what Moses says because it's inconvenient. Okay. But you say, if a man shall say to his father and mother, it's karban, that is to say a gift, by whatever you might be profited by me, he shall be free. Let me tell you what this is saying. <laughs> Korban is an oath. An oath unto God himself. What they had come up with, and I've seen this in the Mishnah, discussion about this. Uh, one discussion that lasted several pages. If you make an oath and promise everything you have to God, but your parents need it at any point, um, which is more binding? The oath that you made to God or the commandment that binds you to your parents. And the sages all unanimously said, why by all means the oath. I mean, this is literally in the Mishnah and Jesus is talking about it in the first century saying, listen, this is what you're doing. How, why would you say it is korban? Why would you make an oath that says, I give all of my possessions to God? I give all of my possessions and everything I own upon my death to God so then dad goes broke and loses the farm and he says would you help me out oh I'd love to dad I really would but it's against my religion you see I've made an oath to God <laughs> now you talk about evil but what is this a revelation of people play games the heart is deceitful, desperately wicked. Who can know it? Everything they can do in a fallen state. One of the things people like to do is, well, let's just put it this way. There's, there's like, in my view, three levels of legalism. One is justification by works. Very few people in America that I know of believe in that. You know that, that if there's one thing preachers preach over and over and over again, not saved by works, and that's rightly so. You cannot be saved by works. So that's one kind of legalism. But that's not the only kind. How about the other kind? Well, you, you can have legalism where you put traditions above the Word of God, where you start observing man-made traditions, and ultimately people tend to gravitate toward those to the exclusion of the word of God. And then the third kind is this kind, where the heart is deceitful, desperately wicked, and looks for loopholes. The Philadelphia lawyer inside of all of us is going to find a way to get excused from our obligations to the law of God through this kind of scheming. And you know what makes it really bad? 
It has the appearance of devotion. Wow, you dedicated everything to God? Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> Sorry, Dad. Sorry, Mom. I'd love to help. I really would. It's all Corban. That's all you had to say, by the way. Corban. Corban for anyone that could ever be benefited by this. That's one of the oaths I read in the Mishnah. Say, Corban to anyone who could be benefited by this. I devote it to God. Then it's yours to use as long as you're alive. You don't have to give it to anybody else because it's already devoted to God. And you have the added hypocritical benefit of righteous feelings. I'm sold out. I gave it all to God. This is sick, right? This is what Jesus calls out in Mark chapter 7. And this is literally still in the Mishnah, by the way. Uh, Moses, verse 10, Moses said, Out of thy father and mother, whoever curses his father or mother, let him die the death. Now he threw in Exodus 21. Whoever curses his father or mother, let him die the death. Well, I didn't curse the father or mother. Well, according to Jesus, you did. Once you said to him, anything you might have been benefited by me, I'm sorry, I can't give it to you. It already belongs to God. I've given it to God. Sorry, that is a curse, and that curse will bring the death penalty on the person who engages in it. So Jesus is talking in a language that the hearers should have understood. Verse 11, if you say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, it's korban, that is to say a gift, but whatever you might be profited by me, well, then he's free. You're free. Free of what? Free of your obligations to God. Based on what? Well, the freedom came from my obligation to this man-made tradition. Kind of scary, isn't it? One of the things about this passage that always has scared me, even though I don't think I've ever done that, I don't feel great about everything I've ever done, but I don't think I've ever given myself an out by distorting the scripture. <laughs> if I had it to do over again, I'd treat everyone in my life way better than I already have. But what? Use the scripture? But it still scares me because what this is a revelation of is the human heart. Let's take this a step deeper. One of the major prob problems with first century Judaism, Phariseeism, is that they lacked a doctrine of original sin. Now that has got some amazing implications to it. If you don't have a doctrine of original sin, then everything, nothing is gonna fit, right? Um, for example, most, I, most people I know that don't believe in original sin, which I do know people that don't. And one couple in particular, I know why they don't believe in original sin. They've never had any children. <laughs> you don't have to have a child for 10 minutes before you believe in original sin. Okay, you know those little guys are sinners. And if they had the power, they'd destroy you if you're one minute late with their meal or whatever. They scream and yell and you think, man, what if he could put that power into action? I'd be dead, right? It's a good thing God makes them so cute or you throw them out the window, all right? But the thing is, the Pharisees didn't believe in that. Now, they did have a kind of a weird belief about the neutrality of the soul. It's capable of great good and great evil. That's not the same as original sin. So to them, like the law of God is instruction for an already good soul. Therefore, in a sense, the application is from the outside in. Oh, I just need to know what to do. I need to know what right to do. I need to know what ritual is demanded of me. Everything's from the outside in. And here's where Jesus brings the strongest teaching, in my view, in Mark chapter 7, in Mark, and it's about original sin, okay? He says, you suffer him no more, verse 12, to do aught for his father or his mother, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which you have delivered, and many such like things do ye. Now, before I go into the teaching, let me talk a little bit about the Ten Commandments. Why are the Ten Commandments mostly negative? You shall not do this, you shall not do that, you shall not do this, you shall not do that. Why are they negative? Because we're already inclined to do the very thing that he's telling us not to do. And why is that? Because we are fallen and corrupt. 
And there's something wrong with our heart. Our heart is not neutral. It's not a blank slate that could go either way. Our heart is deeply corrupt. The Pharisees didn't believe that. That's why they had no mercy on, on people they considered to be sinners. Why won't you do right? You should do right. You know the law? These people know, or maybe you don't know the law. Well, why don't you know the law? They believe that you could just naturally do right, and therefore they can't have any mercy on people that mess up their lives. We believe people are just corrupt from birth. The wicked go astray from the womb, the Bible says, speaking lies. You know, babies can lie before they can talk. All parents know that. All parents, because they can't they can tell when you're saying, no, no, don't touch that outlet. And then you turn your back, and then you turn around, and they're reaching out to touch it. Then they go like that, you know. They're lying. They're liars. <laughs> they're rebels. <laughs> Now look, this has all bearing on discipleship, on your whole approach to spirituality, on your whole life, whether or not you believe in original sin. Jesus has said, you people are so far from God and you have no idea. And look what you do with the holy law of God that you claim to revere. You twist and manipulate and find loopholes and you even exalt another law above it, a law much more amenable to you, a man-made law that exalts itself against the law of God. Now, this is the last thing they thought they were doing, I guarantee you. Sometimes things need to be pointed out to us, right? Now, let me go on. Okay, so you make the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you've delivered. And many such like things do you do. When I was a Catholic, it was like, if you die, you have to be purified. If you're a believer, you have to be purified. You have to go to pur uh, purgatory. I actually once bought a scapula, which is a little metal that you bought in the ba basement of St. Louis Church with a picture of Our Lady of Carmel. And she had appeared to people, Mount Carmel, <laughs> and said, anyone that dies wearing my scapula within a Sabbath day of their death, I will escort them out of purgatory. Millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars are spent buying masses for people, especially really notorious people like mafia figures, to get them out of purgatory. You ever notice the old-fashioned mafia anyway? They used to have huge Catholic funerals. They're murderers. <laughs> purgatory is a doctrine, of, obviously, of men, right? But it nullifies the most important part of the Word of God. And what is that? That Christ suffered for our sins once and for all. It's either Christ or that. But you can't have both. Either Christ suffered for your sins and you're saved, or you suffer for your sins. Now, Christ suffered for our sins once and for all, so there is no purgation period. All right? So basically, what, he, what Jesus warned them, he warned in the Catholics, he's warning everybody. By your traditions, you make void the word of God. Now, I remember uh, early in my salvation, I hope you'll indulge me on this, there was a deliverance doctrine, a, a new do doctrine of deliverance. People had this teaching, and it goes like this. It's from, they would use scripture, but they, they abused it. They said, the sins of the fathers would go down to the third and fourth generation. So therefore, what that means is that even though you're saved, you have millions of demons still. This is, this is the extreme level of the teaching. And you must go through deliverance. Because your grandmother was a witch and you never renounced that. You're under a curse. And your great-grandmother was probably into the occult. And your great-grandfather was a mason. And so you go through and you renounce all these sins of your ancestors. Now, this isn't the word of God. This is the teaching of man. They use the word of God. But they abuse it. Because every, every scripture in the Bible, it says the sins of the fathers. First, it says, I will visit the sins of the fathers. Who? God. Well, are you going to cast out God? I will visit the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. I will show mercy to the third and fourth, to those who love me. Okay. But they said, well, because of the sins of your fathers, you have demons. Basically, all these traditions end up doing is nullifying the gospel. 
They deny the sufficiency of Christ. They bind people's consciences. I know people that I, chances are they did become possessed because they listened to these teachers and were pers persuaded that they had demons. And the devil will accommodate anyone that week. They will come in and give them a good show, a big show. And the whole thing is a denial of the word of God. Now, I think I've made that point enough. Let me move on here. He says, uh, 14, then when he called all the people to him. See, this previous argument is with the leaders, but now he gets all the people together. And he says to them, listen to me, every one of you, and understand there's nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. That the religion is not from the outside in, that everything that hurts you bubbles up from the heart. <laughs> it's actually comforting to think, oh, it's not me. It's everything out there, demons and my ancestors or whatever. But when you have to face the fact, what? Yes, listen to what he says. This is a very powerful thing. Okay. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. When he was entered into the house from the people, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. And he said unto them, Are you so without understanding? Don't you perceive that whatever thing from without enters into the man? It can't defile him. You, you could go to the market and buy a chicken from a Gentile, and that's not going to defile you. Salvation by separation is false. It, it doesn't enter into the heart. You might get some germs. <laughs> it won't go in the heart. It goes in your belly. And then it gets eliminated. And he said, it's that which comes up out of the man. That defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, listen to this category of sins. It just comes bubbling up. Out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, that's envy, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. This is your Lord talking to you. This is your maker. God, what's wrong with me? Well, your heart. And out of that heart comes some very evil thoughts. And those evil thoughts produce some very, very evil fruits. And he gives this whole terrifying category of sins. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. What's he saying? The law of God is moral. And it addresses itself to us as moral beings. It's not the outside in, it's the inside out. It addresses itself not to the external, but to our heart and to our conscience. So that means I need to cleanse my heart. How long does that take? It's a lifelong process. <laughs> Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Man, that's my problem. Evil thoughts produce all these evil fr uh, fruits. And how many realize, and I, I've taken more time than I intended on this part of it, but that that just changes your approach on everything. Here these guys are trying to wash their hands and get the defilement, get, oh, get away from the bad people. When their heart, like the Apostle Paul talked about his own life, he said, wow, I thought I was keeping every one of the laws until I came to the 10th. Came to the 10th commandment and it just like slew me, it just collapsed me, why? Oh, because the 10th is the one that goes right down to the heart and the conscience. You shall not covet. What? Yeah, you should not want anything that the Lord your God has not given you. <laughs> he could pull off, I didn't murder anyone, although he did. I mean, you, people lie to themselves. 
I never committed adultery. I remember I read the Sermon on the Mount. I never committed adultery. Jesus said, you look on a woman to lust. And I just realized, man, bubble, bubble, gurgle, gurgle. The sewage of my life. And yet we can undertake a lifelong heart cleansing discipleship. A constant application to the bread and the cup of life and to the teaching of the word of God. And like Paul says, to the renewal of our mind. We're not stuck. But it's got to come from the inside out. We've got to be internally guided. Now I want to say one more thing about this chapter before I go. Okay. It's all a flow. They're all saying he's unclean. He goes out. He touches unclean things. Unclean people touch him. And he's making everyone else unclean. He's really an agent of the devil. So then he puts this story on it. Verse 24. From there he arose and went into the borders of Tyre and Sidon. Now let me say something. This is the only time in the Gospels where it says Jesus left the Holy Land. He went across the border up into Lebanon. Now, does anyone remember a famous queen that came from Tyre? Jezebel, the princess of Baal. And even the rabbis of Jesus' day said, there's a lot of idolatrous places in the world, but the most idolatrous place that we can imagine is Tyre and Sidon. Josephus said that Israel's bitterest enemies, we have many all over the world, but our bitterest ones are in Tyre and Sidon. Where did Jesus go? The dirtiest, most adulterous place, idolatrous place on earth. Why? Well, I think partly he wanted to get away. The crowds were just pressing him so much he couldn't rest. He rose and went to Tyre and Sidon and entered into a house and would have no one know it. He was hiding out. Last place they'd think of. By the way, who else hid out in Tyre and Sidon area? A great prophet, King Ahab was after, Elijah. Went up there, and who did he meet? A pagan uh, widow woman who was desperate. And God granted her great deliverance, right? Well, I like this story because Jesus replays it, that story. It says, a certain woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit. Of course, there's so many idols, then you're going to have demons. She heard of him and came and fell at his feet. She's not Jewish. She doesn't know the God of the Bible. But she recognizes in him. Now think about this in closing. This is why the story is here. The whole thing's about true or false cleansing, right? This unclean woman recognizes who Jesus is. Whereas the, quote, clean Pharisees. They wouldn't bow down at his feet. They tried to make the case that he was demonic. She fell down at his feet. Oh, that's deep respect, but even more than that, that's desperation. Why? Demon-possessed daughter. Now, there are many people in the churches today that have demon-possessed children, that's for sure. There's a reason the Bible says, my son cast himself in the fire over and over and over again. Because God wants you to know that Jesus cares and he will give us deliverance if we seek him. So she fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by nation. And she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. But Jesus said unto her, let the children first be filled. For it's not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it under the dogs. That's all he called. He called her a dog. <laughs> How would you like to go to a church and ask for prayer? They say, "Get you're a dog. I mean, what are you doing here? <laughs> Jesus called her a dog. And she answered and said unto him, Yeah, Lord. Yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. She would not be deterred. Now, usually when I tell this story, I take a lot more time. But I mean, it's like, Real faith, real faith will not be deterred. It will not be put off. And it's based on desperate need. Like those elders of Israel that were accusing Jesus, they're supposedly the sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're no sons of Abraham. They didn't have the faith of Abraham. or They weren't like Jacob who wrestled with God. 
This is the lady that's like Jacob. She wrestled. Because in Matthew, the story is like the disciples tried to get rid of her, and Jesus tried to get rid of her, and then he called her a dog. She would not let go. She's like Jacob. She clung. And she answered and said unto him, Yea, Lord, but the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. And he said unto her, For this saying, go thy way. The devil has gone out of thy daughter. And when she was come to her house, she found the devil gone out and her daughter laid upon the bed. Father, in the name of Jesus, there's so much more to these stories and this record that we could even do justice to. But I pray that you'd breathe the breath of life on this sermon, on those listening and those here, and that hope and faith and life will come that for anyone trying to go from the outside in, that they'll get it, they'll get, the, get it the other way. That if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation, that you give us a new heart and you can help us reclaim our heart. And that all is from the inside out, Lord. Father, I pray for the consciences of everyone hearing the word tonight. For you have said, Lord God, that the goal of our faith is, uh, the, the goal of our instruction is faith out of a pure heart and love and a good conscience. So Lord, I just pray for that, Lord, that no one will be bound by external man-made rules, that everyone will be free to be internally guided and to truly please you, Lord, that we'll love each other, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.